Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ovarian Cancer Australia's Information and Support Webinar. My name is Vanessa Alford. I'm part of the support team at OCA. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're on and pay my respect to elders past and present. I'd also like to thank AbbVie for, for uh, providing the funding to deliver this webinar, for which we're extremely grateful, especially during these challenging times. We're so grateful that we can continue to provide resources and to support our women. This webinar will address the psychosocial aspects of living with ovarian cancer. We have three incredible presenters who are going to share some valuable information with you. The webinar is interactive, so over the next hour, you can ask questions to our presenters by using the dark blue hand icon at the top of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of each uh, speaker's presentation. Please note that presenters cannot address individual medical cases. If you have a particular question, please call the Ovarian Cancer Australia Information and Support Line on 1300 660 334. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Ovarian Cancer Australia website. For technical assistance during the webinar, please phone Redback Support on 1800 733 416. So I'm extremely privileged to introduce our presenters to you. Our first presenter is Dr Gemma Gil Gilchrist. Dr Gilchrist is a senior clinical psychologist with a special interest in the emotional care of individuals and families coping with cancer. She's actively involved in research to develop new ways of treating common fears and concerns, as well as improving communication between patients and health professionals. She's the founder of the practice Mind My Health in Sydney. In this webinar, Dr Gilchrist will speak about the emotional roller coaster of coping with the fear of the cancer recurring or progressing and some strategies to help manage these emotions. Our second presenter is Hayley Russell. Hayley is a support coordinator at Ovarian Cancer Australia and a trained counsellor specialising in cancer care and grief, trauma and loss within a community palliative care context. She's currently involved in several research projects in ovarian cancer, including fear of recurrence. Hayley will speak about maintaining self-care and self-compassion through an ovarian cancer experience. And our final speaker is Claire O'Donnell, who was diagnosed with stage four high-grade serous ovarian cancer about four and a half years ago at the age of 47. She's been on treatment since that time and is currently on a clinical trial. Claire does not put her life on hold because she has cancer and recently travelled around Australia in a motorhome for seven months, where she received chemotherapy at various hospitals along the way. Claire will share her experience of how she has coped with living with ovarian cancer and how she manages her fear of recurrence. So I'd now like to bring to the microphone our first speaker, Dr. Gemma Gilchrist. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking for the next sort of 15 minutes or so. And um, seeing the next speakers too, I'm kind of keen to hear what they've got to say, particularly Claire and her travelling round. Um, but I'm going to talk about the fear of cancer recurrence. Um, it's, a, it's a big topic. We're going to touch on bits and, and bits and pieces and some ideas, some of which you'll be really familiar with. Others might kind of get your juices flowing and get you thinking about things. So, um, and, you know, of course, we can talk about questions and things afterwards. What I've found since I've been working in cancer care is that the fear of the cancer coming back is something that is pervasive right across all the different um, all the different cancers and right across doesn't matter when someone was diagnosed or what age they are or what their background is or what their, what their diagnosis was it's something that that most people struggle with and I think when you think about the, and the survivorship I, I know it's a bit of a buzzword and some people you know it gives them antibodies and they don't like it but I'm going to use it anyway survivorship that kind of bit where that you know a bulk of your treatments kind of finished for that first time comes with lots of of, of uh, big challenges for people and a lot of searching on what all this has been about and what it all means and as you know i don't need to tell you guys a lot of things feel different emotionally things have changed physically things have changed often perspective on life's changed and going to touch about that in a bit and so the the normal that everyone seems to want to get back to is kind of anything but normal um, and, the, and the fear of the cancer coming back is a very big part of that. And I think when, when people hit that sort of that phase, that, that survivorship phase, often 
people think before they hit there, they're going to feel kind of relieved and triumphant and bulletproof and grateful and they're going to want to meditate all the time and feel very zen about things and have a whole new life perspective and whatever. But actually what happens is a lot of people feel really anxious and really stressed and traumatized and fatigued and lonely and often patronized and misunderstood by a system that says, you bobs your uncle, see you later, off you go. And so we say, you know, what what are some of the big fears about when when you know fearing fearing the cancer coming back? What are the two? What are the big fears about? And I always thought of it like two sort of there there are two arms to this. This all feels a bit weird doing it on a camera, but whatever. And and I think a lot of people think it's fear of the cancer, fear of the of losing our lives to cancer. And yet certainly, obviously, that's one bit. But it's not just about you know, will I die from this? If I come back, will I die? That really depends on what your experiences have been, you know, and what you've seen in your life. So some people at the first time ovarian cancer or any cancer has been seen in their family. Other people have lost parents. Other people have lost siblings or people that they really adored or been through other illnesses. So the context of where you're at in your life makes a big difference. And things like, you know, this is how my leaving my life or being really sick could affect people. This is how it could affect my family. Will I lose control? Am I letting people down? Lots and lots of fears and worries bubbling up about actually, is this going to end okay? But the other side of it, which I think people aren't expecting as much, is the idea of, well, I can't face treatment again. You know, I, that's, it's one of those things where a little bit of knowledge is a very bad thing or ignorance is, isn't bliss or whatever. Once you've been through it once, you can't pull the wool over your eyes and you know what it's like and you take one look at that and think i'm not going for that twice thanks ever so much and so the idea of life being hijacked and, and the impact on work and finances and relationships and all that stuff is really foremost so it's not just about you know coping with the cancer itself it's about the whole baggage when we think about what fuels the fear of cancer coming back um there's lots of things, you know, it's on TV all the time, the adverts, the fundraising is fabulous, but it's it, but it's all around us. The anniversaries, you know, the celebrities getting diagnosed. Um, there's also a lot of inconsistency that fuels fear of cancer recurrence. So things like who can who follows cancers up where we've got four of us here um, who are speaking tonight from four different states. And you can bet, bet your bottom dollar that things are handled slightly differently, rural, metro, different states, different protocols, blah, blah, blah. So all of that stuff can make, make you feel nervous, as can this uh, the idea about how cancers are followed up. Now, I've called it, you know, well, I haven't called it. It's called scanxiety. Scan scanxiety. I can never say that word. Um, and it's really that dread, you know, that horrible foreboding dread. And for some about scans or tests, and for some people that's just before routine reviews, but some people it, it really builds up for months and months and months, and it's completely debilitating. Other things that wind you up about being frightened of the cancer coming back are the, all the stupid things that people can say and all the pl cliches and platitudes. And I won't, you know, go through all of these in the interests of time, but all those things like, oh, don't worry, you've had one baby, you know, one baby's enough, you know, it's fine. Well, it's not fine if you came from a family of six and you wanted five babies or six babies or whatever. Or if you've had no babies and that was something that was really important to you, okay? You've cheated Jeff, be grateful to be alive. You've got a second chance, so meditate, change the way you eat, stop drinking, exercise. You shouldn't stress so much, really important not to stress. And so all these ideas or whatever that come at you about, you know, I don't know, does stress cause cancer? Everyone says it's caused cancer. And, and all these kind of myths and ideas and, and ways of being perfect that are completely unattainable and based on, on not a lot often, but, but society believes them and sort of rams them down your throat all the time. And I think often people expect you to put it behind you and don't worry about you coming back and, and you can't. No one can, you know. So I like Aunt Acid. I don't know if any of you have come across um, her before, but she says some very pithy things. And so, of course, we've got to remember not a lot of the way you feel after cancer is, is actually about some of the feelings of others and taking on their baggage and ideas. So obviously, I'm touching on things very briefly, but I wanted to touch on kind of about five or six things that I think have been helpful to putting it to putting it all back together to try and help them and um, help cope. The first thing, information is power. 
and um, <laughs> if COVID has taught us anything, I think it's, it's um, and I suppose it's taught us a few things we weren't expecting, but one of them is information turns out to be pretty important. Um, I saw this clip today, actually, and it said, I never thought I'd be putting more alcohol on my hands than in my mouth. Anyway, um, the first thing we need to do with information is, is make a plan. So for, for, for your particular situation, it ask if there are things that you can do to reduce recurrence and what surveillance you need is right for you. Because you might be sitting, you might be in a support group, you might be sitting next to someone in the weight room who has a totally different situation, so have circumstances and different treatments, and so therefore is in different, different follow-up. And it's that stuff that can really send you wobbly when you don't need it. So talk with your medical team about what you look out for and is there anything you can do. And the symptoms to look out for, it, it, look, it's difficult, and it's particularly difficult for some cancers, and ovarian cancer is one of those cancers, where a lot of the ways is just normal body feeling and normal being a woman actually changes, you know, we change sensations all the time. We still feel stuff in our abdomen and our bowels and other places all the time. So it's actually really quite difficult to work out what's important and what's not. And so, but what, what I find a lot of, of people do, and women do, is they will start really focusing, for example, I've called it cancer of the pinky toe, but people may get, you know, a terrible pain in the in the top of the, you know, on the top of their neck or or in their arm or something, which is probably because they've been gardening or I don't know, doing COVID baking or whatever, you know, wherever we're doing, and it's actually overuse, but you just start jumping at shadows all the time. So if there are things you need to be um, aware of, then be aware. Okay. Oops, I don't know what am I doing? There we go. So communicating with your with your treating team is super important. And be open about how you feel, but also we all know you've got a short period of time with the doctor, so we haven't got 25 minutes for a long explanation about how you feel. To actually say, I'm really frightened of the cancer coming back, it's playing on my mind all the time, and I want to talk to you today about this, 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 and this, and my priority is this and this. Because you focus the doctor, and, you, and they're kind of like, okay, they thought they might be covering this, and you're knowing, you know, this is what I need to cover. Otherwise, you finally wind yourself up into saying what's important, and your 15 minutes or whatever is up, okay? Or you get the different registrar every time, and you feel like nobody particularly knows you or whatever. So don't let fear and avoidance stop you getting information. Make sure you plan for your appointments. And same with your GP. You know, we get quite anxious going into these appointments. So put a bit of put a bit of effort in. And you, look, your GP is really, really important. So finding a GP you trust is really important. And GPs vary widely. Some, um, and, and often people have lost a lot of trust in medicine, you know, delayed diagnosis or people, people that have said, no, nah, it's all normal, you weren't sent for the appropriate tests or whatever, it's easy to lose trust. So getting a GP and a team that you trust is really important. And if you don't trust your GP, work with, find, keep working around until you do find one you can communicate with that works well. Um, a, G a good GP is not necessarily one that sends you off for tests every five minutes, though, because that is something else that can escalate a lot of fear. And so you kind of want the GP that can be solid and sit with you and test when you need to test and you learn to communicate because the road is long with managing fear of recurrence. We can't jump at every shadow in the first couple of months. Um, but having said that, We've got to be realistic. There is no certainty. And I know a lot of people will ask me and ask, ask our doctors, I just want to know, I wish I had certainty. Isn't there a test? Isn't there a scan? Can't you tell me it's cured? Why won't you use the word cure, etc.? And it's really frustrating. It's not done in medicine. Um, actually, we've got one of our, one of our beloved um, medical oncologist who's, who's retired. And for about the last six weeks, he was delighting using the word cure everywhere because he was just getting right into it and thinking, this is good. I can sort of say this now because I just want to be able to say it in my career. Um, but, you know, really, a doctors can't be specific. But it's not the first time we've lived with uncertainty. Oh, there we go. So other things we can do is make sure you take control with other people's horror stories. And I will say it's just like when you're eight and a half months pregnant and everyone tells you their birth story and you really don't need to know it. It's a bit late at that point. 
having cancer is a bit like that. Everyone's got a theory. Everyone's got an alternative um, or complementary medicine they want to recommend. Everyone's got something they read about on the internet. Everyone's got someone with a story that might have started well, but it always ends badly. <laughs> Okay, you can see them digging themselves deeper and deeper into this quagmire of crap that they're going to be saying to you. So just cut them off at the pass. Now, I, I'm, you know, I only listen to stories with happy endings. Thanks for sharing your story. I know there's a lot coming at you, but I, I just want to hear about what's been happening with you. Don't feel you owe people information or you have to with their head nodded on the side looking sage-like and pitying. If that freaks you out and sets you off, just you take some control. Get phrases that you like, uh, that you're comfortable with, and start using them. Equally, if someone's newly diagnosed and they're leaning on you a lot, well, then it's okay to say, you know, to put some limits on that. Okay. So that's communication with other people and getting information. Nurturing your body. Yes, it's important. Don't, you know, but also I think... You have to be sensible here. I often use this phrase saying, think of yourself as a diamond, cut some bits, which are not helpful, but most of it just needs a bit of a polish. And putting lots of pressure on yourself to do everything in extremes means that it's very difficult to sustain. So get yourself into habits. Look, my, you know, mindfulness meditation and other things are marvelous, obviously good nutrition, exercise, all those things we know we should do. We know we shouldn't have sat here and done 15 extra COVID kilos because it was really interesting eating, great eating chocolate while no one could see us, but we do it. Life's like that. But every now and again, do a stop take and don't think about it from a cancer point of view. Think about it from a well-being point of view. What makes you feel good about you and in your body? And go for, for that sort of point of view. And you can't be awesome all the time. It's just not possible. Okay, so just try and do what you can do. And tomorrow's another day. Okay, thoughts and feelings. Um, Cancer changes how people view life normally. It's a normal response. You might feel very disconnected from other people as if they don't understand you, as if you're not on the same page, just a totally different book. Your roles have changed, and it's all right to grieve those losses. And there's this phrase I love by Patricia King, who you're, most of you may have heard of, or some of you may have heard of, and she talks about fluffing your emotional pillows, and I always love that phrase, and I think, yeah, we need to do that when you've been through what you've been through. A lot of perspectives can change. I actually see a lot of relationship breaks up, breakups in my job in this, in this phase after treatment, and divorces and separations are high. And this girl says, while she's getting herself ready for dinner, she says, now I think of it, I think I'd look better without you. And she's not the only one that does that in relationships. So if you've been struggling, you don't have to keep up struggling. You can make choices. I also talk about balancing up a seesaw of stress, thinking about all those things that load up on you, you know, relationships or chemo or fear of the cancer coming back or, or stuff you're unhappy with with work or the fact you don't like aspects of your appearance or whatever it is. And then the good stuff. Look, this this whole seesaw thing is way out of whack at the moment. Um, but think about your personal seesaw and make sure you get enough on the good end. I'm going to flick through that. So getting enough on the good end means thinking about thinking about what matters to you in your life. And I use an example of a dartboard. And when we're hitting the bullseye. We're living a life doing stuff that matters to us. And we all spend our time doing a whole lot of stuff that doesn't really matter to us. And it's uh, and I think times like this is a good chance to do a stop take. Why, I've, why values matter so much to help fear of recurrence is because a lot of the fear is actually also about, is what I'm doing now enough? Am I with the right person? Am I in the right job? Am I okay? If, it, if I were to lose all of this for cancer or for whatever reason, anything in my life, has it been okay? And if it's not okay, and we know that there is a sense of constant disquiet. So making this a really good catalyst to go, you know what? I count. My life counts. I want to do it well. This is a good chance to do that. And it helps bring a lot of peace, actually, for people. Remember as well, this is not the first time you faced uncertainty. It's rubbish that you have to have uncertainty to feel calm. You don't. 
If you've changed jobs or, or been divorced or moved countries or had children or not had children or any of the things, the major events in life, you've been in a period of uncertainty. We're all in a period of uncertainty at the moment. OK, we've done it one way or the other. We kind of had to. So, so think about what's worked for you before. Draw on that resilience resources. What brings you joy? Where do you like to put your energy? Who can you turn to? Who sinks you down? Who floats you up? Think about those resources before because that's what helps you feel less frightened now. Last minute or two, I just want to talk about challenging some of the really unhelpful thinking. And obviously, this is something that we can talk about for hours just as a topic in itself. But lots of really unhelpful, destructive thoughts like I'll never have another relationship. I'm damaged goods. There's no point in stopping smoking or drinking. because It's not going to make any difference. I'm never going to be the same again. Sex is never going to be part of my life again. I've got nothing in common. Blah, 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 blah. All that horrible, negative, squidgy, horrible muck in our heads and the horrible, critical voice that some of it is normal. This much is normal. This much not normal. OK, so we all need to be able to deal with unhelpful thoughts in our heads because it's not actually these awful mountains about, you know, chemotherapy and all that we conquer. This is the this is the hard bit. This is the tough bit in any challenge. Um, I'm just looking at the time, so I'm not going to focus on that because I wanted to show you a couple of resource books that I like. Often we struggle with the same thoughts. And I often use this phrase which says, don't wrestle, think about your, your think about um, your uh, thoughts as a pig in mud. Don't wrestle with, with the pig in mud because you both get dirty and the pig likes it. All that's going to happen if you wrestle with your thoughts is you get twice as many and twice as filthy and you're twice as unsettled. This book here, I don't know if you can see, it's called The Happiness Trap by Russ Harris. Some of you may have come across it. And there's also The Reality Slap. It's a good resource. Have a look at that and you'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about. Another book about living. Oh, look, this has got a good title, hasn't it? How to Live a Good Life. That just makes you want to buy it off the shelf. I didn't write this or anything. I'm, so I'm not, it's not like I'm in a marketing campaign, but it's, it's a good idea. It talks about connectedness. It talks about community. It talks about other things that help fill up our buckets of life to help us feel good. Mindfulness is good. Um, this bloke said, it didn't come up very well on the, but on the screen, but the guy says, can I call you back, Ed? I'm just trying to be in the moment here. Being in the moment we know helps us good evidence for it, for all sorts of well-being. And you don't have to like the particular moment you're in. You can change your moment. That's OK. Other things that can be destructive are things like expectations. You don't have to take on every expectation that people gave you. And we need to realize that and part of working with your thinking or getting professional help to, to manage your thinking is realizing that your thoughts and assumptions and ideas and beliefs, we all have horrible, mucky ones that aren't helpful. OK. Do, 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 do. I might just talk about professional help just quickly to say um, as I leave my last slide up, but professional help um, can help, obviously. I think of it a bit like a pyramid. OK, a lot of the time, most of us just need to talk to someone, feel understood, be part of support groups, reach out, talk to our friends, do that stuff. There's some people in the middle that need a bit more help, a bit more counselling, thinking about, you know, online stuff, reading self-help books, whatever. And then there's the pointy bit and the, and the bit of the middle bit, which is about, you know what, I'm distressed by this. I get panicky. I hate tests. I don't cope. I don't sleep. I've got other issues. I've got relationship problems or depression or whatever it is. There's help in, it, in all the public hospitals and the private systems to, to deal with that stuff. OK, my last one, I call the little acronym of the, the, the I just made this up. It might be complete rubbish, but I sort of I quite like it. So I call it Courage to Shine. It goes through each of the bits and pieces that you can think of while you're trying to manage fear of recurrence. And obviously, I can't talk them all about in detail now, but it gives you a bit of a roadmap to kind of reassure you, I guess, about this can get easier. And it does get easier. So I might hand that back to you, Vanessa. I hope I haven't gone on for too long. <laughs> No, not at all. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilchrist, for that uh, valuable presentation and, and so much great advice. Um, we've just got one question at the moment. Um, 
and it is, I'm worried I'll never find this any easier. How do you make, how do I make myself stop thinking about it, about the fear of recurrence? Oh, look, I think that's something that, that most people feel, actually. They're frightened of the cancer coming back in the beginning and they feel like that intensity is going to be there all the way through. And um, and actually, this is a big generalisation, but you tend to find that at least after the, you know, the year or so after finishing treatment, and I know that that can seem like a very long time, but for a lot of people, it does start to come down. And it doesn't come down like this. You'll be thinking, oh, I'm not doing too badly, and then you know, something will happen to trigger you or it'll be scan time or a celebrity will get diagnosed or one of those triggers I was talking about before. That is normal. OK, so think of it like the waves on the shore. Sometimes sometimes you're you know, in the beach, not that any of us have done that for a while. But, you know, sometimes we've got to bob over the waves and we're OK and we get into a rhythm. And sometimes one just goes over the top of you, even though you thought you're in control. That's normal. So I think one of the awful things is people really want to get rid of thoughts and getting rid of thoughts is is almost impossible to do. It's like me saying to you, whatever you do, do not think of a blue giraffe. Try really, really hard not to think of a blue giraffe. And of course, we can't because our brains, it's just like touching wet, wet paint. Once we've thought about it, we go over and over and over it and rehearse it. So trying not to think something tends to make it worse. But actually learning how to have it there, and but you don't have to struggle with it. It's the fear of cancer. Yep, it shows up whenever someone talks about cancer, whenever you see an advert, there it is. Yep, I feel frightened. It's not a nice feeling, but it passes like a wave. I know it always passes. Okay? And each wave over time gets a bit less intense. So actually having an expectation that you can kind of sit next to it and you know be reluctant you know neighbors with it is is a much easier strategy than trying to think i just can't think about the stuff i've got to get it out of my head and don't let anyone else tell you you need to either because it's because it's, that just makes them feel better but not you you'll, you'll do this in your own time that's great thank you so much again dr gilchrist for giving up your time and, and presenting on this webinar um, I'd now like to bring to the uh, to the speaker our second speaker, um, Hayley Russell. Thanks, Hayley. Go ahead. Thanks, Vanessa. I'll just um, I hope the camera's on me at the moment. Um, I can't quite see it, but that's okay. So thank you so much, Gemma, to, for that presentation because there was so much in a, in a short amount of time. Um, and we actually um, will speak about some of the similar things and talk about some of the same um, authors as well, which is great. So we hear a lot when we're answering calls uh, on the support line about fear of recurrence. And then something else that I talk a lot to women about is going through an objectively really difficult thing like a cancer diagnosis or treatment all the time afterwards. And then those messages in our heads, which Gemma has just spoken about, which is not only is this really difficult, but I'm also doing it wrong. And all the shoulds that come into our mind, um, those voices that say, I've got to stop wallowing, I've got to stop feeling sorry for myself, or I'm, I'm being weak. And that's what I want to address today, is how do we actually nurture instead some self-care and self-compassion um, for yourself as you're going through treatment. So, what is self-compassion? So, if we think of that inner critic again, what can happen when we think about um, a situation and we start to criticise ourselves is that we go very quickly from this situation is bad um, to I am bad myself and the way I'm coping with it is not okay. So an alternative to that is to think of ourselves with warmth and forgiveness instead. Um, the other way I put it sometimes, um, and it was mentioned just before, is treating yourself as you would uh, a beloved family member or a friend. Um, and another way I speak about it is, and stick with me because it might sound a little bit strange at, at first, but treating yourself like you would a little child. So. Um, if we see a toddler who's really distressed, who's having a tantrum, we rarely say, okay, come on, you've really got to pull up your socks. You've got to, you know, act differently today. What we usually do is we have, we get really curious and we say, okay, well, this child 
struggling? Do they need, are they hungry? Do they need a sleep? Do they need, just need a hug? Do they need to be held? Um, do they need some distraction? We get really curious and really compassionate about that child. Um, so again, encouraging that similar kind of view of ourselves as well. Um, and really giving yourself credit where credit is due and setting um, goal posts for yourself that are realistic. Often women say, um, I can't do anywhere near the kind of things that I could before cancer treatment. I really expect to be able to get back to that and saying, well, maybe there are days where actually, in fact, um, a really big achievement is going to be, you know, I made myself a healthy lunch and I walked around the block and giving ourselves credit for those things that um, we do achieve. The really good thing about um, self-compassion as well now is that they're starting to get um, some emerging evidence um, that it can actually affect the way that we um, are in terms of decreasing cortisol, which is the chemical that we produce when we're stressed, um, and also increasing heart rate variability, which is to do with our ability to self-soothe ourselves. So there's there's more um, research emerging. And a lot of the things that I'll speak about uh, is research by a woman called Kristen Neff, uh, and you can see a lot of her stuff on selfcompassion.org. So to go a little bit more deeply into how we actually um, talk to ourselves kindly and nurture self-compassion and practice self-compassion. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about someone that's already been mentioned today, which is Ralph Harris. Again, the happiness trap, a lot of his stuff is on his website as well. But he talks about how we can build self-compassion, the building blocks of self-compassion. Um, and these are not necessarily something that have to go in order, they're just thoughts to think about that might help you when you're thinking of um, treating yourself in a self-compassionate way. So the first one there, just acknowledging your pain. And again, might sound obvious, but how often do we try to push things away or push them down or bottle them up and say, nope, not feeling that, not allowed to feel that, not going to feel that today. So instead, just saying, okay, I'm feeling a lot of stress come up. I'm feeling a lot of anxiety come up. That could be because my scan's next week. Or I'm feeling grief because this cancer treatment means that I'm not um, going to be able to take part in something I really want to uh, in a couple of months. Or I'm feeling fear because I'm really worried about my, my cancer progressing. So just acknowledging those rather than drowning them out because that can give us the message that we're not allowed to feel certain things, that some some... Uh, emotions are not allowed to be felt. So as well as acknowledging the pain, when we start to acknowledge the pain, often um, we can go really quickly to the judgment of it. So uh, I'm feeling sad about the event, but that's just stupid. It's just a birthday party. What am, what am I talking about? Um, you know, you sh I should be stronger than that. I should just be able to to deal with this or I'm only allowed to think positively. Look, I'm thinking negatively again. So that judgment comes in really strongly. So thinking about diffusing that by just observing that that's there. Okay, that little judgy voice is coming up again. It's there. It's a viewpoint. It's not necessarily the objective truth. It's just a, a, a thought that's coming into my mind at this moment. If we, if we give it too much credit, that voice, what can happen is that we can go a bit further into that cycle of self-judgment which we, which you we want to avoid. So just observing that that, that judgment is there and not um, connecting in with it too much um, can be good. And then can we act with kindness towards ourselves? So, so many women I speak to, the most compassionate people you could possibly imagine to everyone else around them, they would say that kindness is amongst one of their highest values it's so difficult to switch that and then apply it to themselves. So practicing in that moment, kind self-talk. So what would it be like to say to yourself, well, that's a really understandable feeling given everything that I'm going through. Or it's okay to feel whatever I'm feeling in this moment. So practicing that kind of self-talk. Um, and in a minute, I'll cover some other acts of actual acts of self-care that we can do for ourselves which give us that same message of self-compassion. Um, so then just going on to a couple more building blocks um, that Rath Harris speaks about. So acceptance 
of feelings, and this goes back a little bit to what Gemma was speaking about, that, you know, we would, um, that feeling of, uh, I really, I just want to block it out. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to feel it. I don't want to um, go anywhere near it. But, uh, again, that can sort of, they come up, don't they? And sometimes I describe it like a beach ball, the beach, you try to shove it under the water, and eventually it just back, back in back in your face. So it's the idea that if we accept them, if we allow them to sort of flow through us, then actually we notice that, okay, maybe I felt a bit different towards the end of the day. Maybe that eased a little bit, something else came in, um, another feeling came in, and we allow them to um, shift and change. Um, and that very often those feelings aren't permanent or the final feeling that we'll feel. And this is probably the time where I'll um, reiterate the message that if these are feelings which feel really overwhelming, if they're stopping you, you know, completely from living life, if they're affecting your sleep, um, or if you're feeling really low mood or high levels of anxiety, always good to get in to your GP and to the rest of your medical team to seek further advice. But these are, um, yes, in those kind of more um, extreme situations. So going back to the building blocks, validation. Validation that it's okay to feel what we're feeling. Um, so that, that, that um, sentence in our head sometimes which is, you know, okay, it's difficult, but what are you complaining about? Because, you know, that some other people have it so much worse and, you know, you, um, imagine, imagine other people who are struggling, which is objectively true but not really helpful um, often because it can invalidate the way that you're feeling. No one knows your own feelings or your own pain and there's no hierarchy in this kind of thing. There's no, okay, well, um, she is feeling it more than me. Um, so it's important to validate and say, okay, actually I can, um, I'm allowed to feel these things. And then finally, connectedness. Connecting with other people who love you can really help us with our kind self-talk because they're usually um, saying, hopefully, a lot of good and affirming things. They can remind us of our strengths um, and they can remind us um, of of how loved we are and they can really support that that kind self-talk. And I'll just finish this little part with um, a quote from these um, this, uh, these building blocks of self-compassion, which is that your pain is not a sign of weakness. It is, it's a sign you are a living, caring human being. So moving on now to Self-care. So self-care and passion is the attitude that we're trying to take to each other and to take to ourselves um, and what we're trying to nurture. Acts of self-care can be things that we actually do to take care of ourselves. Um, now, there's no prescription I can give for this. I can't say everyone go take a bubble bath because half of you will say that I hate that baths are disgusting. Or um, So there's no, there's no prescription I can give. But we can ask ourselves the question, what comforts? sustains and recharges me. That starts to give you clues about the things that you do that really help. So for some people, it is spending time with loved ones. Um, for some people, it's um, exercise. You know, there's lots of biological reasons why exercise is good, especially outdoors, if you can. For some people, it's expressing themselves creatively. So ask yourself that question. Notice when an act of self-care has helped. And take note of it and say, well, how can I do more of that in my life? And on screen now is just um, a few different ways. It doesn't look too great. But again, this um, comes back to the mindfulness aspects as well. Ways to take a break, but also just to notice, to be mindful in the moment, to notice your body as well. And you can find this if you... Google 50 ways to take a break. It's a really lovely one to print out and put on the fridge or put on the notice board. So what I might finish with is just um, a brief self-compassion meditation. So again, the um, researcher and psychologist that I mentioned, Kristen Neff at, on selfcompassion.org, there's a lot of meditations like this uh, which you can listen to, guided self-meditations um, on self-compassion, um, but what I've cobbled together is a combination of a few different resources that will just take us a minute to go through and might give you a little bit of a tool that you can use in moments um, of distress or anxiety. 
Um, so if you do feel comfortable, you can close your eyes. I won't be able to tell if you do or don't, so um, that's fine. And just um, try and get yourself comfortable in your seat or wherever you are at the moment. Give yourself a moment to be still. So the intention of this meditation is to take you through how to identify and have insight in moments of distress and how to respond with self-compassion. So when you're ready, maybe you could call to mind a moment that has been tough in your ovarian cancer experience. So maybe one of the examples we were talking about earlier, anxiety around the scan, um, you know, struggling with fatigue. So we want to bring that to mind and absorb, uh, observe ourselves in that moment. And can we gently say to ourselves, this is a moment of suffering. So that's the mindfulness part. Just acknowledging this hurts, this is stress, or I'm feeling anxious, giving some words to it, ouch, this is, this is tough today. And the next part is about telling ourselves that difficult times are a part of being human, that it's common to everyone in humanity, even though our pain is different, but it's common to everyone who is a human. And therefore, we're not alone in the way that we feel. Other ways to think of it is, what I'm feeling is really understandable given my current situation. Now, as you start to bring these things to mind, perhaps put your hand over your heart and feel the warmth of your hand and the gentle touch of your hand on your chest. Or you might want to adopt some other form of soothing touch. So for some people that might be um, just gently stroking their arm or gently massaging their jaw or neck. Just connecting with yourself in a, in a compassionate way. And as you do that, can you say to yourself, may I be kind to myself? You might also ask yourself, what do I need to hear right now that expresses kindness to myself? There might be a special phrase for you which really speaks to you in your particular situation. But for the next 30 seconds or so, I'll just go through a few, a few options that might ring true. May I give myself the compassion that I need? May I be peaceful? I have negotiated every other bad day or obstacle that life has thrown my way. I am aware that I deserve unconditional love and compassion. May I be loving, kind, and compassionate towards myself. I'm aware that as a human being, I'm fallible. May I be patient and understanding with myself. I will recognize my own successes and will not feel guilt, shame, or remorse over my more difficult days. I'm aware that there's a reason for each of my emotions. May I gently look at the sources of my painful emotions. May I always remember that I deserve love and compassion from myself. Just as other people are deserving of peace, love and happiness, so am I. So this practice that we've just done can be used any time of the day or night um, and it can be really be used to help to remember to evoke the major aspects of self-compassion when you need it the most. So feel free to open your eyes and come back in to this room where you are at the moment when you're ready. That's about all that I have for you. And I'll hand back to Vanessa for any questions. Thank you so much, Hayley, for touching on so many important areas and, and for reminding us just how important self-compassion and self-care is. Um, we do have a question. Uh, someone's written, my mind races at night. That's when I worry the most and it keeps me awake. 
Um, mm-hmm. and do you have any tips to help me switch off and, and help me get to sleep? Yes, yes. Yeah. So that's it's such a common time, isn't it? You know, we may be distracted during the day, we may be doing things, and when we go to bed at night, all of a sudden it all rushes in in that way, in that moment. So there's a lot of great tips um, for sleep that are available. I think it's really important to look at um, what we call your sleep hygiene. So what are you doing in the time leading up to bed? Um, and trying to make sure that you do things like um, switching off technology, having a little bit of a routine to do things that are calming. Um, you know, for some people that's um, your chamomile tea, that's taking a, a warm bath or a shower. So getting a little routine set up so that um, you're telling your body, okay, it's time to sleep. It's actually not time um, to to worry at this at this moment. Um, some people find uh, useful something called, um, you know, making a time for worry. So saying, okay, there's things that I need to think about, but actually maybe it's best that I think about them tomorrow. You might even write some of them down and then giving yourself a time the next day, just 10 minutes to say, all right, I can worry on them now um, and giving yourself, so sort of delaying that to a time where it's actually going to be more useful to think about these kind of things. Um, and I think going back um, to what Gemma was speaking about as well um, previously, so just really noticing when you get in that cycle um, and trying to do some circuit breakers to um, say, is this really helpful? So you ch- actually in that moment ch- challenging your unhelpful helpful thinking and saying, is it helpful to be um, ruminating or um, thinking over and over on exactly what the doctor said? Or, um, you know, is that helpful in this moment is, is sort of the, um, the thought. So those are some ideas. Great. Thanks. Great advice, Hayley. Thank you very much again for joining us on this webinar. So I'd now like to bring to the microphone our final speaker, Claire O'Donnell. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Obedient Cancer Australia for inviting share my story with you and to talk about how I cope living with cancer and how I managed the fear of recurrence. So a little bit about me. Um, Perhaps like many of you, I remember the day that cancer came into my life like it was yesterday. It was in fact four and a half years ago. Again, my story might be similar to many, many of you. After eight months of going to my GP with symptoms of extreme fatigue, swelling of my abdomen, and extremely painful periods, my GP told me that I just needed to lose some weight and I would be fine. He never examined me, he never palpated my abdomen or did any tests, any blood tests. By the end of the eight months, the swelling had extended up towards my chest and I was coughing a lot. And unknown to me at the time that it was pleural pleural effusion that was causing this cough. By this time, GP had said that I had a virus. I asked for a blood test at this point, and I was told it wasn't necessary, as a virus can take a long time to clear, and I just have to be patient. So at this point, I changed my GP. At the first meeting with my new GP, she sent me for some scans. And to cut a long story short, cancer was found in my chest cavity, close to my heart, tumours in my liver, stomach, momentum, pelvis and ovary, and it was stage four ovarian cancer. My GP explained that it was terminal and that I may have less than 12 months to live and that I should get my affairs in order. I had three months of chemo surgery and then a further three months of chemo. I'm very lucky. I responded responded very well to the chemo, and then I was administered Avastin every three weeks for three and a half years. Then the Avastin stopped working. The cancer was back. I had genetic testing done before going on a trial. It found that I am BRCA negative, but HRD positive, which meant that I was suitable for a heart inhibitor trial. The trial also included an immunotherapy with the part, but I had a reaction to the immunotherapy immediately. I got very sick as it was attacking my liver. 
So I'm now on the part inhibitor only. I'm now on Alapidib. So that's where I'm at now. So back to normal. Well, survivorship comes with a lot of hurdles and what is normal. After a cancer diagnosis, we all have to live with whatever is a new normal. And a big part of that for me was the fear of recurrence and learning to live with that fear of recurrence. So how did I cope with living with ovarian cancer? When I was told it was terminal, I knew I had two choices. One was to mope around it and be upset and, and why I think of why me. I chose the other option to get out and enjoy every single day. I kept thinking, let me live. I'm, I want to live till 50. I'm too young to die. All I'm asking for is just two years. But I'm glad to say that was four and a half years ago. Everyone was telling me to get to complete my bucket list, but I really didn't have one. I love this beautiful country and I decided to buy a motor home and go out and enjoy the beauty that this country has to offer. When my six months of chemo was finished, we started our travels around Australia. I didn't realize that I was going to be on a vast in chemo, so we had to plan, had to plan this trip with precision. We had to book chemo for every three weeks in a different town or city, wherever we were going to be. We had a wonderful response from the oncologists around the country. They were happy to see me and agreed to sign off my chemo every three weeks. I cleared it with my health insurer and off we went on our adventure. Me, my husband Mark and our dog Ruby, living the life that we wanted to. So I think something Gemma said was after having a living a, a her having a full time job of dealing with surgery, chemotherapy, side effects, managing hospital appointments, etc., it is time for great relief. I was positive, I was positive and energized for those first couple of years, but then I started thinking of the current. It just sneaked up on me usually at the most inappropriate times and as Haley just mentioned it was for me it was late at night or it was when I was alone or when I was trying to sleep the fear of reoccurrence is never far away especially at bedtime and those thoughts creep in and then by the morning I think why, why worry why was I so worried this cancer came upon me so so out of the blue and I guess my recurrence will so why am I spending my evenings in bed worrying about it at all but I did worry and there were a couple of times I got very scared and I actually ended up in accident in emergency a few times one, one time I was coughing up blood I thought I thought I was coughing up blood when I was brushing my teeth before I went to bed again it was like bedtime we ended up in accident in emergency and uh, they had gave me some x-rays to check our blood clots in my lungs. The x-rays were all clear. Four o'clock in the morning, I was still in A&E. The doctor still couldn't find out what was wrong until he saw some blood running down my lips. He examined my mouth. Turns out it wasn't a blood clot after all. It was, in fact, just my gums bleeding, which was a side effect of my treatment. I felt really stupid, and I think the registrar did too. So there's a few a &E, late night a &E trips. There was one when I when we were on our road trip, and I had real heavy pain in my arm. I thought I was having a heart attack, and we pulled into a country town hospital, and they, they quickly ECG and etc. Tested my heart was fine. And then they linked me up with a, an oncologist in the city through Skype, and he explained part one of the side effects of my treatment is muscle pain, severe muscle pain. That's exactly what I had. If I had only known about what my symptoms were, it would have saved me a lot of anxiety. And uh, yeah, I wish I, I wish I'd checked that out previously. I now 
I've learned, I've now have now learned about the side effects of my treatment, so that I don't panic and I don't cause that unnecessary anxiety. I accept that for the rest of my life there will be fear of recurrence, but I now make sure it doesn't take over my life. I like to keep up to date with trials, know what is available for when the ovarian cancer returns. And it gives me great comfort knowing that how, how many trials and how far we are coming with ovarian cancer in the last four years since I've had the disease. Um, I've had to make a few changes to my life to help me cope. Uh, I've had to teach myself, and these some of these things are what um, Haley and both and Gemma has also said. I had to teach myself that it was okay to take longer to do everything. Yeah, I had this chemo brain, I was so slow, and I had to work hard to not be to not be hard on myself. I did have to limit watching reading news, watching the news or reading the news to reduce the chance of the anxious um, thoughts popping up in my head. In fact, when I got diagnosed, we didn't turn the TV on. We didn't have a newspaper in our house for the first 12 months. We lived in our little bubble, and that worked for us. But I do have to admit, since all this COVID-19, I see a lot more online news. I do notice anxiety creeps in a little bit. So for me, that's something that I need to work on again. Um, for myself, forgiving myself, stop being critical on myself, love myself more, spoil myself, take time for myself. In the early days, I always felt that I needed to do more. Now it's okay. I allow myself to have my unproductive days, my untidy days. Physically, I get a lot more exercise now. I find help with yoga and Tai Chi um, and body balance. And I also just simply walking, walking my dog on the beach with my husband just helps my state of mind. And I would encourage anyone, there are lots of exercise classes free through Cancer Council Australia. And that's where I started to, to um, exercise again through them. So I'd recommend anyone to look that up. I did try meditation through them, but meditation just wasn't my thing. I do swim a lot, and it took me a while to realize that swimming is my form of meditation. I would get in the pool, count my lens, and think of nothing else. So for me, that worked as meditation. There are triggers that fuel my fear of recurrence, and I understand from a lot of people it's the same triggers. So birthdays and anniversaries, Christmas, scans or waiting for my, my results, set off triggers of, of fear, or the death of one of my ovarian cancer friends, that always gets me panicking. New Year is a particular difficult one for me. Um, while we were traveling and we were in Sydney for New Year fireworks, it was one of the loneliest experiences I've ever had. Fireworks were magical. The whole evening was magical, but I hated every single minute because that sneaky fear of the occurrence had set in. And instead of enjoying myself, I kept thinking, this could be my last new year. This could be my last celebration. And it was lonely. I kept thinking about dying. It was lonely and it was very, very lonely. And most of you know, that's what this fear of the occurrence can do to us. It correctly sneaks up on us when we least expect it. So self-aware, I, I, I'm aware that I have to be very self-aware. Aware of changes in my mood. I'm, in change, I'm aware of starting to panic again about my health. You know, is this another cancer coming back? And then it spirals, the worries just spiral about the future. But what has helped me cope is I get involved in, in quite a few projects. It keeps me occupied. Um, I help out at a group called Survivors Teaching Students, where we go into uh, the local universities in WA and we talk to the future doctors. 
um, the future medical team and about we talk about our diagnosis of ovarian cancer, our symptoms, the issues that we had, why how it took so long to get diagnosed, etc. And that just gives me the opportunity to give back, but also knowing when you're standing in front of 300 medical students and you can hear a pin drop, you know they're listening, they're learning, and they're taking that on. So that helps me. Also, I help out when I can with ovarian cancer, Australia. I enjoy helping out with this sort of presentation. I've been involved in think tanks and uh, writing articles for the media on ovarian cancer. Um, I've also contacted a couple of health ministers um, to highlight our issues of ovarian cancer, um, but that's another story. Um, I meet up with the women that I started treatment with four and a half years ago. We stay strong and we stay connected and we all understand each other and we all have that same desire to enjoy every day. So I guess that's um, like a support group. Another thing that helps me is knowing the next step of my journey. I ask my doctor what happens. If this doesn't work, then what happens? I like to be prepared. It helps me mentally. And I had to do this again last week. I was worried about not being able to stay on this trial because of the side effects. And then after speaking to my oncologist, I now know what his plan is. I know there is a plan. So I can stop worrying about that now. Um, I also uh, joined some support groups. Um, so ovarian cancer in Australia, um, it, we have a, a support group in Perth. And the first time I went in there, I met ladies who've had ovarian cancer for 11 years. It was a huge inspiration for me. I thought I was going to die quickly. And then I heard other ladies have a similar story about 11 years ago. Um, and as Haley said, when I travelled around Australia, we'd pop into Melbourne or, or Sydney ovarian cancer groups. And I've also joined some Facebook groups that help um, ovarian cancer Aussie and Kiwis support group, ovarian cancer UK. And more recently, I joined one called Part Inhibitors, Drugs and Trial Support. And again, it's, it's learning supporting each other and learning from each other, hearing other women talk about their side effects, knowing that these side effects are normal. Another important thing is our carers go through the fear of recurrence. I know that from, from my husband, what he's going through, and, and I think probably most carers go through. And we're not always good at noticing the fear of recurrence in our carers, noticing that they're scared, they're scared about us having the recurrence. I know our situation, my husband needed counselling to deal with his fear of recurrence. And now that my cancer is back, he's needing counselling to deal with the fact that the recurrence is here now. So it's a constant battle for his emotions also. But I have a, I have a simple plan for dealing with my um, fears. My plan is distraction, exercise, talking to people who are in the same position through our support groups. For me, knowing the symptoms, I know what to worry about and what not to worry about. So I'm not worrying over every single niggle like I used to. And now know, knowing that the fear will pass. So yes, we do get fear, but knowing that the fear will pass, it's just a wave that helps. When I was um, preparing and, and doing a lot of research, I find this little um, extract on the internet. I'm not quite sure. It says it's an, an anonymous author, but I thought I would like to share it with you today. So it covers what cancer cannot do. We've talked about the fear of recurrence, but cancer cannot do. Cancer is limited. It cannot cripple love. It cannot shatter hope. It cannot eat away at our peace. It cannot destroy our confidence. It cannot kill friendship. It cannot shut out our memories. It cannot silence our courage. 
It cannot invade our soul. Cancer may have robbed me of his blissful ignorance, but tomorrow will always be there. But in exchange, it has granted me the vision to see each day as a precious gift to be used wisely and richly. Thank you for your attention. I'll hand back to Vanessa. Wow, thank you so much, Claire, for giving us, you know, that that fantastic insight into your journey and for being so open and honest in sharing your experience. I'm sure everyone on this webinar really appreciates it. Um, and I actually just want to read out uh, what someone has written. Thank you so much, Claire, for sharing your experience. Um, after diagnosis, I had a similar feeling that I described as get busy living or get busy dying, and I chose to get busy living and also stayed clear of the nightly news. I didn't have room for the world's problems. Best of best of luck with your future adventures. So thank you, that was from Beck. Very nice. Um, I have had a lot of questions come through for you, Claire, but we are um, running out of time. So I will just ask a couple that have come through. So I do apologize if your question um, is not asked. The first one is, how does your husband cope? Uh, what support does he have? I know you touched on that briefly, but um, yeah, anything in particular that he does to cope? Yeah, so he, my husband, uh, he wouldn't mind me saying, didn't cope very well. He fell apart. Um, and he took a long time to realize he was falling apart. And I think I was busy trying to deal with my prognosis. Um, and I, I was a bit getting a bit annoyed at him. Just pull yourself together. I didn't understand what he was going through. And I'm making, getting him to pull himself together. And quite a few of our friends have spoken to him and everyone was saying to him, you've got to go and get help. But he didn't see it. He didn't see he needed help. And eventually, he a few months later, he went to through, through um, Cancer Council Australia. Um, he got um, some counselling. He, he met some counsellor there. And he now, seen a counsellor helps him cope. He has regular meetings with his GP. Um, he's sitting next to me. He goes to the way he's feeding me lines. He gets his support from. He comes to Obedient Cancer Australia support group. I know in some cities they don't have the men there. In WA, um, it's open to our, our partners, and he gets huge support from other men who are going through a similar situation. And in fact, if I can just say, back in Melbourne, when we were traveling, Obedian Cancer invited the husband to come along. And it was when he listened to these men talking about how they weren't coping, that's when he realized he wasn't coping, and that's when he went to get help. Wow, thank you. That's, yeah, it's great to hear. I mean, it's so important that we, you know, we, we think about our carers, because as you said, you know, sometimes we don't know what they're going through, and it's really important that, you know, we consider their feelings and whether they're coping as well. Um, just one more question. Who did you organise the travelling chemo with? Um, I'd love to travel, but I'm worried that I would need to have chemo while I'm away. Okay. Um, I had to do a lot of it myself. Um, my, I spoke to my oncologist and he was happy for me to do it. And he recommended oncologists that he knew over on the East Coast. Um, and... At the time, his secretary, she started contacting the oncologist and they said, yep, they were happy to see me. And then I just followed it up, made the appointments, gave them dates when I was there, when I would be there. And um, it was fairly easy. But make sure you, you, you confirm it with your um, health fund provider firstly, to make sure that not all health fund providers will actually pay for your chemo when you're away. But um, yeah, the one I was with would do. So yeah, it was, it was quite simple. A lot of planning. Um, I'd say first step, speak to your oncologist and they might speak to another oncologist that they know of and that probably helps if they speak on your behalf. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Claire. There's obviously the oncologist, you know, they communicate interstate, so um some really good tips there so don't let cancer stop you if you want to travel 
around Australia in a motorhome when the borders open. <laughs> that would be sweet. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire. Um, I really appreciate your time and, you know, your willingness to, to share so openly and honestly. Um, so thanks again. I am conscious of time, so we will have to leave the questions there. Um, I would like to once again thank all our presenters, uh, Dr Gemma Gilchrist, Hayley Russell and Claire O'Donnell um, for the time that they've given us tonight and, and all that valuable information. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you everyone for being on the webinar. Uh, we really hope that you did find it valuable. The recording of this webinar will be posted on our website. I know a couple of people have asked that. So it will be uh, recorded. It has been recorded and it will be posted on the Ovarian Cancer Australia website in the next couple of weeks. Um, and you will receive an email with a link to the recording in the next few days. In a moment, you will be directed to an evaluation form. Um, if you could just take a moment to fill that out as we really um, value your feedback and it will help us to plan for future webinars. If you have any other questions that you would like addressed, please don't hesitate to call the Ovarian Cancer Australia Information and Support Line on 1300 660 334. This is a very challenging time for everyone and we know that some of you may feel that you need that extra support. So please don't hesitate to contact us. Once again, thank you very much for being on the webinar and we hope to see you for our next webinar uh, in, later in the year. Stay safe and well, enjoy your evening and good night.